Heavy sandbag lifting, what can I say? It makes you strong like a strongman, powerful like an Olympic lifter, yoked like a wrestler, functional like a residential mover. It's fun and it's simple. Pick the sandbag up off the ground, lift it from the lap, carry it or shoulder it, and there you go. Simple and effective. Any heavy sandbag program will have these basic movements at its core, and you can stop there if you'd like. The basics are more than enough to completely transform the way you look and the way you move, but if you want more, there are a few other things we can do. Today I'd like to talk about two of those things, starting with one of my personal favorite exercises, the sandbag high pull. The sandbag high pull is essentially just an explosive lift from the lap, but the benefits are many. Start with a sandbag resting horizontally on your lap, wrap both arms over top, take a deep breath and brace, load the hips by pushing your butt backwards and bending over a bit, then violently extend the hips, knees, and ankles to drive the sandbag as high up towards your face as you can get it. Imagine you're trying to throw the sandbag over and behind your head. The most common mistake with the sandbag high pull is relying too much on the arms. You will need to pull as hard as you can with the arms, but most of your power should come from the lower body. It's easy to cheat the movement when you're tired, but relying too much on the arms will defeat the purpose of the exercise. It might help to imagine the movement as a vertical jump, just with a sandbag held against your body. What makes it great? Like most high pull movements, the sandbag high pull will add a lot of mass to your upper back and traps, as well as the spinal erectors, glutes, and hamstrings. All high pulls are good, but what makes the sandbag version stand out is the awkward and bulky nature of sandbags themselves. Because you need to round forward more to hold on to it, I found the sandbag version hits the upper back much more than when you do it with a barbell or dumbbells. It's also much more difficult to hold on to a sandbag, so you should see some nice forearm development as well. Moving on to strength, the main benefit you get from the sandbag high pull is powerful hips. The importance of this goes far beyond any one training style. We can talk all day about how improving ankle stiffness or increasing core stability or whatever will improve performance, and those things are awesome by the way, and they will help, but there's no getting past the fact that power comes from the hips. If someone asked, what's the one thing I can do to become a more powerful athlete overall? The answer is always, build powerful hips, every single time. There are tons of different ways to do that, and you don't need a sandbag for this, but in the context of a sandbag-focused program, it doesn't get much more specific than the sandbag high pull. That leads us to my favorite part about the exercise, carryover to other aspects of sandbag lifting. I've said this so many times already in other videos, but the lift from the lap is the most important part of lifting a sandbag. If you want to carry it, bringing the sandbag higher up on the chest with that lift from the lap will let you go much further. If you want to press a sandbag, you first need to get it into the rack position, which again requires a strong lift from the lap. And if you want to shoulder a sandbag, the higher you can bring it from the lap, the less work you'll need to do later on when it's in a less advantageous position. I went into much more detail on this in a recent video I made about sandbag accessory exercises if you're interested. I'll link it below. But needless to say, a strong lift from the lap will make you better at sandbag lifting period. And because it lets you drill this specific part of sandbag lifting in a focused and repeatable way, the sandbag high pull is a great way to get there. On to programming. There are a few different things you can do depending on what your goals are and whether you care about performance benefits or just want the muscle building effects but assuming you do want everything, here's how the exercise fits into a basic training day. It's widely accepted that power is best developed when you're fresh and able to push with everything you have. With this in mind, it would make sense to put the sandbag high pull at the start of a workout, but if we look at the bigger picture, the high pull isn't the most explosive thing we'll be doing. That honor goes to the sandbag to shoulder. You could also say the high pull is more of a partial movement when compared to a full ground to shoulder lift, and we'll want to focus on the big stuff first. This is actually one of the best parts about the sandbag high pull. Because the range of motion is relatively small, it's very difficult to fail. Our goal should always be to do the movement with as much explosive intent as we can manage, but even if you're wiped out, you can still do the exercise. The same is definitely not true for the sandbag to shoulder. A full shoulder requires 110% effort at all times, and once you hit a certain level of fatigue, continuing on trying to shoulder heavy things becomes very counterproductive and can be very frustrating. This is where the high pole really shines. Once you're shouldering heavy enough weights, there will come a point where you're too tired to keep shouldering things, but you're not so tired as to be completely done with power-based movements. Enter the sandbag high pull. The exercise lets you extend that power-based explosive part of a workout much further than you'd make it with the shoulder alone. 
This makes the exercise a great second movement. A routine I've been using a lot lately, with great success, is to start with the sandbag to shoulder and do as many attempts as I can before I start slowing down and coming closer to missing. Depending on weight, this is usually somewhere between 5 to 10 attempts per side. And keep in mind, this is completely intuitive and it will be up to you to decide when to stop. After the shoulders, I'll do somewhere between 5 to 10 sets of 3 to 5 reps with the sandbag high pull, focusing as much on power as I can. And I prefer sets of 5 or less per set with these, just to make sure that power level stays as high as possible. After the high pulls, the explosive part of the workout is done, and it's time to move on to more pure strength-based exercises. This is where I'll do my carries. Anywhere between 1 to 3 real hard carries is usually enough at this point. And after that, I'll either stop altogether, or move on to something unrelated to actually lift in a sandbag, like abs, neck, or hyperextensions, and that's it. The sandbag high pull can also act as a good replacement to the full shoulder if you're not feeling as powerful that day, or if you're trying to take somewhat of a deload. And the last thing I'll add is the sandbag high pull is a lot of fun. Some days it can be enjoyable to just come in and hit a bunch of sets and call it a day. The other exercise I want to go over today is the sandbag row. This exercise plays a very specific role and might not be necessary quite as often as some other things, but it does what it does better than anything else and that makes it worth our time. You could row the sandbag however you'd like, but for reasons I'll get to later, I recommend doing it like you would a penlay row with a barbell. The sandbag should start from a dead stop on the floor, and your torso angle should remain constant throughout the rep. On to muscle. The sandbag row does pretty much the same thing as any other row, but in my opinion, in a less efficient way. If your only goal is a direct path to building a thick upper back, you're probably better off using a barbell or dumbbells for your rows, as the range of motion on these is pretty small. Or you could just focus more on other aspects of sandbag lifting, like carries or high pulls. But if you don't have access to anything else, these will still get the job done. One thing I will say is the sandbag row fries the spinal erectors more than any other rowing variation I've tried, which makes sense considering the torso angle, so it might be worth it for that. Muscle isn't the main reason for this one though. The sandbag row develops a very specific type of strength and will go a long way towards improving your general sandbag lifting abilities. Just look at the position you have to be in to do this one, completely bent over with your hands on the ground while trying to maneuver a heavy awkward object. Even if this didn't have specific benefits that carry over to lift in sandbags, getting stronger in the most awkward position possible can only help in a general sense. Lucky for us, the sandbag row does have that specific carryover. No other exercise out there makes you stronger off the ground. When lifting a sandbag from the ground in a horizontal position, at a certain point when the weight gets heavy enough, a sandbag becomes so bulky that you have no choice but to combine a deadlift and a row if you want to clear the knees and lap the bag. This is part of why a lot of people fail to lift sandbags that weigh well below what they can deadlift with a barbell. There is much more to lap in a sandbag than just straight up and down with locked out arms. Building this specific strength with a sandbag row leads to rapid improvements. Doing your rows with a penlay style like I mentioned earlier and making maintaining that horizontal torso angle also forces you to use your legs. Because of the position you have to be in to lift a sandbag, it's easy to forget about leg drive, but this is a huge mistake. Connecting with the idea that you are pushing the ground away with your feet makes a world of difference. This translates to any other lifting method as well. Even when the sandbag starts in an upright position on the ground and you don't have to bend over quite as far, the extra leg drive really helps. I'm guilty of neglecting leg drive myself, but once I started doing sandbag rows more often, my strength off the ground was night and day better. Not only does this mean you can lift heavier things, but it means it takes less effort to lift weights from the ground you're close to shouldering, which means you'll have more energy left for the shoulder attempt and you'll be more likely to get it. The sandbag row also has very specific carryover to the one motion shoulder, if that's something you're interested in. You need to maintain that horizontal torso angle for longer when going for the one motion, and doing your rows this way will prepare you. As for programming, I think the sandbag row is great as your first strength-focused exercise for the day. If we look back at the example day I went over earlier, this means the sandbag row would go after high pulls and before carries. So your day would be sandbag to shoulder, sandbag high pulls, sandbag rows, sandbag carries, and you're done. You could also choose to do these in place of the high pulls, depending on your current weaknesses and what you're trying to work on. Either way, I still think working on the most difficult exercise first, which will most likely be the sandbag to shoulder, is a good idea. I'd also recommend making sure you're 100% warmed up before doing the sandbag row, because it does focus on that super awkward position. 
I've had great success adding sandbag rows to my routine every third or fourth sandbag training session. And that's it for today. I hope you guys like this one. I hope you got something from it. Let me know if there are any other sandbag exercises you'd like me to talk about. I'd be more than happy to do it. So uh, thanks for watching. And as always, I'll see you in the next one.